Today, I really am pleased to have with us uh, Mike McGrath, formerly of the OpenShift engineering team and one of the founding members of OpenShift, who has recently switched over to work on Project Atomic and lead some of the engineering efforts over there. And he's going to um, give us a little bit of the background on what Project Atomic is and, and how it works in context with OpenShift. And so I'm going to let Mike introduce himself and go from there. Take Hi, yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, like Dan said, my name is Mike McGrath, and I'm currently working on uh, the internal team at Red Hat. Their name is uh, under Application Infrastructure. And basically, my uh, my role there is uh, on the architecture side. I help try to pull a lot of these different pieces together. And uh, Dan, can you uh, mute your light? Yep. Doing so. I'm getting a little echo. Thank you. And so uh, my role is just to kind of take all of these different pieces and merge them together into uh, uh, what becomes Project Atomic. And I'm going to talk to you today about some of the overlap of the two and, and how they how they work together. Uh, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about OpenShift and how you can actually take Project Atomic and Atomic Hosts and, and actually uh, very directly integrate them and some of the plans that we have for that. So first thing up, Project Atomic. Uh, so Project Atomic and these Atomic Hosts are a new way of developing and deploying and managing operating systems. And so, you know, this, this is not your grandma's operating system that we're creating here. Uh, the Atomic Hosts provide a seamless way to sort of to upgrade your, your operating systems. And so uh, you'll see some, some examples later. Yum is not on these systems. None of that uh, OS tree is an actual new technology developed uh, by Colin Walters that allows us to upgrade an entire operating system at a time uh, as opposed to just parts of it. And so uh, traditionally what you, you think of as a YUM upgrade, you might get a bash update, and maybe JBoss, and the rest of your operating system persists. Uh, this is a little bit different than that. And uh, the idea here is that the, the hosts are very small. And so this is an actual command that I ran inside of a Fedora-based atomic host uh, just before the meeting. and. Uh, it has about 319 uh, RPMs on it. And the idea is that once you have this operating system up and running, that you will uh, be pulling everything else in by containers. And uh, I'll give some simple and one fairly more complex example of that later. And so uh, in, in the container sense, when you're coming into use uh, Atomic, we're kind of assuming you already have your containers made. And that is one fundamental difference between us and, and Overshift, where Overshift ha uh, is you know, providing the sort of build environment for you uh, uh, for a a and deployment, deployment environment. Uh, our, our system is much more simple. So you've got to take your containers or consume ones that already exist, your containers, and deploy them onto an atomic system. So I'm sure that you kind of get it. It's a little bit different. Well, here's some examples on how you'd actually use the thing. Uh, first, you need to download uh, one of the atomic operating systems, and you can do this through three different ways. Uh, there's a Fedora-based one that uh, is very brand new. There's a CentOS one that's a little bit older, and then if you need a fully supported environment, obviously we have uh, the Red Hat supported uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux version. Uh, you can check out more of those at projectatomic.io. Uh, but once you have it up and running, uh, you'll notice that some of the commands you typically use aren't there. I mentioned yum before. Uh, but also parts of the operating system are actually mounted read-only. So if you try to remove slash user bin, uh, you can see here that that failed miserably. And that's because this is a, a very different way of, of doing your operating system. So uh, one of the things that you'll notice when using Atomic, and one of the commands you run a lot, is the Atomic command. Uh, Atomic uh, ties into a couple of different things on the system. Atomic host actually ties into uh, the actual host itself that does the upgrades. And so atomic host status gives you information about what you're currently running. In this case, you can see I've got a timestamp from uh, March 24th. It's running version 22.24. I've got a basic ID, uh, and the OS name is uh, Fedora Atomic. It's pretty straightforward. So the question is, uh, this is a pretty old version at this point. Uh, let's say I need to upgrade to something newer. To do that, you run the atomic host upgrade command. <laughs> and this actually goes out to a Fedora website and downloads uh, information from a mirror. In this case, it downloaded some metadata and some objects, uh, and you can see it, uh, it took around, the, the transfer time from the remote mirror took around two minutes, about 120 seconds. And in that, it downloaded several new packages, uh, it added a new package, Docker 150, and 
and uh, even though I've run Atomic Host Upgrade, the system is still running on that old version. It's downloaded all this new stuff, but it's not actually using it yet. And so in order for me to start using it, I have to reboot. And so uh, this is something uh, you know fairly new to the whole chickens and pigs things where you know, we want to reboot uh, often when, when changes happen. And so uh, systems like OpenShift and, and other things like Kubernetes can help make your applications highly available, but the expectation is on the atomic side that when you upgrade, you're doing a full reboot uh, to bring that system back online. And so uh, once the reboot is done, uh, if something went wrong, you can also run atomic host rollback to roll back to the previous version. And uh, it keeps multiple versions at a time. In this case, the rollback uh, took only three seconds. And uh, I've cut a lot of the output from both of these just so they fit on the slide. But it actually does tell you what packages changed or added and removed and everything else. And just like before, when you do a rollback, you have to reboot to get that uh, that system back online. And so just a quick run through, we did an atomic upgrade. We just pretended, we rebooted and pretended something was wrong with it. And then we rolled back. And if we run the atomic host status command now, we can see that both of these versions now exist on the system. We can select from either one. Uh, but uh, after that second reboot, we have officially rolled back to the previous version that's noted by this star here. And this is configurable. You can select multiple uh, operating systems at a time. And if you want to know more about how those work, I suggest you just get started. But just a, a quick uh, touching point on some of the other things that you need to know. Uh, slash Etsy more or less persists between uh, upgrades. And so if you have a, uh, a situation where you've added users or you've made uh, configuration values in Etsy, those will persist uh, between upgrades. Uh, you don't even have write access to user bin or anything in user, really, so those will always be upgraded as you go. And same thing in, in VAR, uh, most of that stuff will persist between upgrades. And so if you really need to, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if you need to make changes and you're, you're you know, storing logs there or whatever, uh, those logs will remain uh, even after reboot. So <laughs> now you've got your operating system uh, in Atomic up and running. The question is, how do you, you know, do other things? And so for that, uh, we've got Docker uh, as our primary container system. Uh, you can use Docker Run, uh, Fedora Apache, to get the latest information on, or to get the latest image from uh, from Docker Hub in this case. Uh, Red Hat also has a, a registry that we have for the official, our official images, but this one is a standard community Fedora image. It'll actually go out and download uh, all of the uh, Container layers and images that you needed to get an Apache up and running, and by the time this command is done, it will uh, you'll have an Apache image running and exposed, and, and you can actually access it. So, all very normal stuff. And uh, just just to make it clear, Docker is included in that uh, standard atomic image. Uh, one of the more interesting develops developments more recently with Atomic is the invention of these super privileged containers. Now, in the traditional container world, uh, the idea here is that you have an application component or microservice, whatever, and it's running standalone inside of this container. It cannot see other containers. The ho it cannot really uh, see or interact with the host. But if you're logged in as root to the host, you can do things to that container. For example, you could uh, exec inside of the container. You could kill the process. Uh, you know, you can you can actually operate with a lot. And this is sort of a security model that was designed around containers. And uh, we've actually taken that a step farther with SE Linux and other things uh, to make those containers even more contained. But a super privileged container kind of runs the opposite of that, where you want to build an image that may need to interact with the operating system. And so well, why would you want to do this? Well, remember that I had said uh, that you can't install new software onto an atomic host. Uh, you know, Yum was not installed. And as a result of that, our atomic images don't even have our syslog installed. What if you like our syslog? What if you want to use that for your uh, logging and security information? Well, to uh, to use that, you need a super privileged container. And in this example, we've got a rel 7 uh, our syslog container that we've built. And what will happen is uh, our syslog will be running inside of a container, uh, but it will be logging to a location outside of the container. So in this case, you'll see a, a slash var log. And unlike us, this is a, a standard Docker image, but it's got some additional metadata in the Docker file that Atomic, the Atomic command will parse and run. 
And so uh, when you run uh, Atomic install, it'll go out and download that new image, which you can see here. And then it will run the Docker run command with privileged. And it'll actually print the Docker command that it's running. So this isn't like a Docker fork or anything weird with Docker. Uh, instead, this is a convenient way to run a whole lot of Docker uh, flags at one time. And, and I've actually cut off a couple lines of, uh, of the, the command here that, that runs. And uh, so uh, by the end of this, this will actually go out and download the image and install some files onto the actual host. And so I could edit the syslog host in slash etsy or syslog uh, on the host instead of being in the container. Uh, and that gets passed into the container. And this gets a little complicated, but uh, just in general, all you have to know is that you can atomic install rel syslog, and then you can treat that like a normal syslog server. You can edit slash etsy or syslog in the, the location you'd expect to find it in. It's logging to var log uh, in the location you'd expect to find it in. Uh, which is a really neat way of doing things. So uh, the SPC, uh, with SPC installed, uh, I haven't actually started to run it yet. And so just to prove that, I have tried to tail var log messages. Uh, all of these commands are being run from the host, not inside the container, uh, which is an important distinction to make. The next command I run there is the atomic run rel7 r syslog. And you can see the Docker command there that it's running. It's passing things like uh, pki and the rsyslog.conf into the container, and it is also logging that information outside of the container. So you can't see it here because I've cut the wrap the wrapping off, but uh, it's logging to var log on the host. And once it's running, you can just do a tail var log messages, and uh, all the information that you would expect to see in var log messages is there. And so this is just one of the many things that we're looking at doing with super privileged containers. Uh, it's sort of this balance between uh, you know, application data, a lot of that sort of, uh, of workflow, uh, it's very obvious to people how that fits into a container. Uh, but if you're going to be doing these, uh, these atomic upgrades and these uh, very basic systems, what does it mean to run some of the more uh, core uh, features like a syslogger or perhaps identity management? You know, what would it really look like to create an identity-based uh, container and have that run and uh, you know, suddenly have all of these users available on the system, uh, even though the system itself doesn't have any of those identity binaries in it, since they've all been pulled in from a container. And that's what we're looking at doing now with super privileged containers. Uh, when you're going through your first boot configuration on Atomic, uh, a lot of people are using CloudInit. You can also use, uh, there's an installation ISO. Uh, I really like CloudInit for things. And basically, you start it up, Cloud and it runs, and it does all the configuration for you. It pulls down all of your uh, SSH keys or whatever commands may need to be run to set that system up. And so our goal with, with Atomic is to provide the ultimate operating system to run containers on. That's, that's really what we're focused on. Uh, we have uh, Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux Atomic Host is our, our uh, supported offering if you want to uh, use it in a production environment. And I'd also mention the uh, community versions for CentOS and Fedora as well. The, the real key thing here is that by focusing on the needs of a container, we can pick some really sane defaults and, or, and make architectural decisions for you uh, for deploying these hosts. And I think that that's a really uh, neat feature because we can uh, focus on a very specific workload in containers, but inside of those containers you have a more general workload. And uh, trying to uh, you know, provide for the 95% provides really interesting challenges for us to, uh, to make sure that these things can actually deploy. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Atomic for containers? Uh, I logged into an OpenShift meeting. I want to use OpenShift for my containers. Well, that's where uh, this next session we're going to talk about. So the thing to remember about Atomic is we provide a lot of the building blocks uh, for running containers and clusters. Uh, the problem is that it's all kind of DIY. And uh, we generally don't go too far into containers. We, we provide some uh, interesting cool side things that, that we've built for the uh, our syslog, but a lot of the language containers and things you could get and run from, from anywhere, and, and OpenShift certainly has many of those as well. What happens when you get a whole bunch of these containers, or you need to build a lot of them? Well, for that, you're going to need more than just Atomic. Uh, you're going to need uh, orchestration and uh, other workflow items. And that's where OpenShift and Kubernetes come in. So Kubernetes, if you're, if you're not familiar, is built into OpenShift v3. 
uh, and uh, V3 is currently in, in a pre-release. It uh, should be, uh, you know, stay tuned for more news on when it will be actually ready, but you can actually go to GitHub now and, and try it out and, and help develop it. And so the, the whole goal of this uh, is that, you know, you can build these containers, you can run these containers, and lots of them at scale. Uh, and that's really what we're focusing on uh, with OpenShift. Uh, and so using Kubernetes and OpenShift V3, you can actually take over an atomic host and use that for deployment instead of a standard uh, traditional host. And so uh, Atomic currently comes with Kubernetes installed in it, and you can configure Kubernetes yourself if you want, if you uh, enjoy doing that sort of thing and have the time to do it. Uh, or you could just go download OpenShift and have it do all that stuff for you. And so, uh, you know, the real tie-in there is that we're trying to, uh, in Atomic, we're trying to provide that ultimate experience for containers to run including spinning up and spinning down new hosts and all that, uh, so that OpenShift can uh, control and maintain these hosts. Or if you know if you need to do it yourself, then you can do that with Kubernetes. And OpenShift v3, just to make clear, is, is fully supported on standard operating systems like RHEL, but also on those atomic hosts. And it's Kubernetes, uh, it's the Kubernetes orchestration that makes that uh, that feasible and makes it, it makes it popular and possible. So uh, with that, I, uh, I have some, some demos that I, I'm going to run through just to show you a little bit more on it. And if you want to find out more, uh, the, the place to go is projectatomic.io. Uh, but also, uh, Red Hat Summit's coming up. I'm going to be there, and I'd love to talk about this stuff. Uh, and so if you have questions, come find me. So I'll stop for just a second and see if there's uh, any questions. Diane, I don't know. So um, thanks, Mike, for that. And I'm just shamefully saying that um, Blue Jeans is failing us with chat and recording today, so I'm not quite sure why it's not doing it, but I'm getting a little pop-up message from their admin saying it's not working. So, um, That's a bummer. It is a bummer. So I'm going to actually, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to turn um, turn the video on. I guess I can do that for everybody, and people who wanted to have a question could actually raise their hand. Let me see if I can do that. Diane? Yes? Diane, I don't know. Oh, but we all got a message from Bluetooth that said that they have a problem. Yeah, I got that too. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to just, un, un, if you have a question, unmute yourself. I'm going to unmute everybody right now um, and just see how that works. Okay. And also, I'll, I'll say if anybody wants to type into uh, Pound OpenShift on IRC on Freenode, uh, dot net. I'll, I'll hang out in there and see if any questions pop up as well, so yeah. feel free to, to ping me. Just one of those days, guys, um, when the technology actually fails you. So um, the way you could ask a question right now is that you would take yourself off mute, and right now David Chia is the only one who's off mute, um, and ask a question. So I'm going to leave it open for a few seconds, mute minutes here, and Mateus is off mute, and Steve, Stephen um, Pusti is off mute as well. Um, but other than that, no one else has taken themselves off mute. If any of you who are off mute have a question. If not... I'll... Hi, it's Judd. I've got a question. Go for it. Um, last month, uh, the C Groups developers did a presentation at Bloomberg about their re-implementation of C Groups in the Linux kernel. I was wondering how close you, you folks are tracking that and if you see any major re-architecting coming, uh, let's say in the next 12 months, 18 months, as they re-implement C Groups. So our, our C groups in implementation, I think, is largely we're trying to move the configuration and ownership of that more towards system B. And so uh, the the way that the the way the C groups is controlled will change a bit, uh, hopefully for the for the easier. And we are tracking it very closely. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that on Project Atomic we have a very aggressive release cycle that we're trying to work through, especially in the Fedora and CentOS uh, worlds. Uh, but it's also trickling down into RHEL. And the goal there is that uh, Atomic uh, hosts as a whole will be much closer to what is upstream than what a traditional RHEL host is today. And the reason for that is so that we can pick up some of those newer features like uh, 
like to do C groups implementation, but also because you know the, if you're using Atomic Host, then something the containers that really matter to you are found in Docker or Kubernetes. Both of those projects are moving very quickly, and so we do want to pick up those newer those newer features uh, earlier in the cycle instead of later. That's great. That makes a lot of sense. I, I do have a follow-up. Um, Go ahead. How would you, in in a sentence or two, how would you compare the Project Atomic to Core OS? Uh, I think, uh, to me, they're you know they, they operate in very similar spaces. So Core OS, I would say, is very focused on sort of the minimal operating system required to get uh, a a containerized environment up. Whereas I'd say Project Atomic is more focused on uh, some of the enterprise uh, and and scaling use cases. And so you know, I, I if you want to take a look at Core OS, it's definitely out there. Take a look. Uh, but you know. For me, I think we're we're trying to do. I think that we're a bit more enterprise focused today than, than CoreOS is, and that's largely, I think, an artifact of Red Hat's traditional uh, customer base. Makes a lot of sense. So, does anyone else have a question? If not, maybe um, you can roll into yeah, your demo. Go for it. So, what's the best way to get started with Project Atomic? Uh, so, there's two. There, that, that's a two-part question. One of them is, what if I want to develop Project Atomic, and that would mean making changes to OS Street or Kubernetes or Docker. And to do that, I would probably get started, uh, I would join the Fedora SIG mailing list and the Atomic uh, mailing list, and just mention what you want to do and, and get started there. Uh, the next question of that is, what do I want to do if I want to create uh, images for this uh, you know, emerging ecosystem? And for that, uh, I would recommend taking a look at the CentOS spins. Uh, they're going to be a bit more stable than the Fedora spins, uh, but also new enough that they have all the interesting features like uh, you know, anything new that might come about with super privileged containers, that sort of work. And so uh, on, on that side, you know, I would I would start there. You can always ship your images upstream to Docker, uh, the Docker Hub, uh, or if you're an ISV or something, uh, you're also welcome to, to get started with Red Hat's uh, partner ecosystem as well, and there's information on the, the website to learn how to do that. I guess I was also meant, like, how do I, what's the easiest, like, is there, being a developer, if I just want, not a, a being a web developer, I just wanted to try Atomic Coast and try putting some Docker containers in it, how would you recommend that that learning path? Uh, so for that one, I would, uh, I would go to projectatomic.io. There's a getting started page there. And uh, I'd probably download, uh, for me, I might download the, the CentOS version uh, and, and give that a look. Thanks. Yep. Anyone else want to step up and ask a question? All right, why don't we roll into a uh, your demo? Hmm. All right, I think I'm going to give up there. We'll have to save that demo for another day. That sounds like a plan. Uh, we'll get you back and, and cockpits work and, and see what the next revelation is from Project Atomic. Yep. So if, if there aren't any other questions, I'm um, going to let you all get back to your work today because everybody's got lots on their plate as we're coming up to Red Hat Summit, and I'll do a shameless plug for that. Um, you'll see more about all of these projects, OpenShift, Project Atomic, Kubernetes, Docker at Red Hat Summit and as well at um, Dev Nation. So um, if you're coming, please let us know and hopefully we can get a commons meetup as well at the Red Hat Summit. So we'll see you all there and we'll probably see you all next week because we have another session coming up um, on schedulers with Abhishek Gupta um, next week. Same time, same place. So thanks again, Mike, for joining us and um, we'll see what we can do about getting recording out of this one. Take care, all. Thanks, Bye. Diane.